An Apology for the Life of Mistress Shamala Andrews by Connie Kieber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontispiece An Apology for the Life of Mistress Shamala Andrews, in which the many notorious falsehoods and misrepresentations of a book called Pamela are exposed and refuted, and all the matchless arts of that young politician set in a true and just light, together with a full account of all that passed between her and Parson Arthur Williams, whose character is represented in a manner something different from that which he bears in Pamela, the whole being exact copies of authentic papers delivered to the editor. Necessary to be had in all families. By Mr. Connie Kieber, London. Printed for A. Dodd at the Peacock, without Temple Bar, 1741. To Miss Fanny, etc. Madam, it will be naturally expected that when I write The Life of Shamala, I should dedicate it to some young lady whose wit and beauty might be the proper subject of a comparison with the heroine of my piece. This, those, who see I have done it in prefixing your name to my work, will much more confirmedly expect me to do, and, indeed, your character would enable me to run some length into a parallel, though you nor any one else are at all like the matchless Shamala. You see, madam, I have some value for your good nature, when, in a dedication, which is properly a panegyric, I speak against, not for you. But I remember it is a life which I am presenting you, and why should I expose my veracity to any hazard in the front of the work, considering what I have done in the body? Indeed, I wish it was possible to write a dedication and get anything by it, without one word of flattery. But since it is not, come on, and I hope to show my delicacy at least in the compliments I intend to pay you. First, then, madam, I must tell the world that you have tickled up and brightened many strokes in this work by your pencil. Secondly, you have intimately conversed with me, one of the greatest wits and scholars of my age. Thirdly, you keep very good hours, and frequently spend a useful day before others begin to enjoy it. This I will take my oath on, for I am admitted to your presence in a morning before other people's servants are up, when I have constantly found you reading in good books, and if ever I have drawn you upon me, I have always felt you very heavy. Fourthly, you have a virtue which enables you to rise early and study hard, and that is forbearing to overeat yourself, and this in spite of all the luscious temptations of puddings and custards, exciting the brute, as Dr. Woodward calls it, to rebel. This is a virtue which I can greatly admire, though I much question whether I could imitate it. Fifthly, a circumstance greatly to your honour, that by means of your extraordinary merit and beauty, you was carried into the ballroom at the bath by the discerning Mr. Nash. Before the age that other young ladies generally arrive at that honour, and while your mamma herself existed in her perfect bloom. Here you was observed in dancing to balance your body exactly, and to weigh every motion with the exact and equal measure of time and tune, and though you sometimes made a false step by leaning too much to one side, yet everybody said you would one time or other dance perfectly well and uprightly. Sixthly, I cannot forbear mentioning those pretty little sonnets and sprightly compositions which, though they came from you with so much ease, might be mentioned to the praise of a great or grave character. And now, madam, I have done with you. It only remains to pay my acknowledgments to an author, whose style I have exactly followed in this life, it being the properest for biography. The reader, I believe, easily guesses. I mean Euclid's elements. It was Euclid who taught me to write, 
it is you madam who pay me for writing therefore i am to both a most obedient and obliged humble servant connie kieber letters to the editor the editor to himself dear sir however you came by the excellent shamala out with it without fear or favor dedication and all believe me it will go through many editions be translated into all languages read in all nations and ages and to say a bold word it will do more good than the clergy have done harm in the world i am sir sincerely your well-wisher yourself john puff esq to the editor sir i have read your shamala through and through and a most inimitable performance it is who is he and what is he that could write so excellent a book he must be doubtless most agreeable to the age and to his honour himself for he is able to draw everything to perfection but virtue whoever the author be he hath one of the worst and most fashionable hearts in the world and I would recommend to him in his next performance to undertake the life of his honour, for he who drew the character of Parson Williams is equal to the task. Nay, he seems to have little more to do than to pull off the parson's gown, and that which makes him so agreeable to Shamala, and the cap will fit. I am, sir, your humble servant, John Puff. Note. Reader. Several other commendatory letters and copies of verses will be prepared against the next edition. An Apology for the Life of Mrs. Shamala Andrews Parson Ticklext to Parson Oliver Reverend Sir, herewith I transmit you a copy of Sweet Dear pretty pamela a little book which this winter hath produced of which i make no doubt you have already heard mention from some of your neighboring clergy for we have made it our common business here not only to cry it up but to preach it up likewise the pulpit as well as the coffee-house hath resounded with its praise and it is expected shortly that his elder will recommend it in a letter to our whole body and this example i am confident will be imitated by all our cloth in the country for besides speaking well of a brother in the character of the reverend mr williams the useful and truly religious doctrine of grace is everywhere inculcated this book is the soul of religion, good breeding, discretion, good nature, wit, fancy, fine thought, and morality. There is an ease, a natural air, a dignified simplicity, and measured fullness in it. That resembling life outglows it. The author hath reconciled the pleasing to the proper. The thought is everywhere exactly clothed by the expression, and becomes its dress as roundly and as close as Pamela, her country habit, or as she doth her no habit, when modest beauty seeks to hide itself by casting off the pride of ornament, and displays itself without any covering which it frequently doth in this admirable work and presents images to the reader which the coldest zealot cannot read without emotion for my part and i believe i may say the same of all the clergy of my acquaintance i have done nothing but read it to the others and hear others again read it to me ever since it came into my hands and i find i am like to do nothing else for i know not how long yet to come because if i lay the book down it comes after me when it has dwelt all day long upon the ear it takes possession all night of the fancy it hath witchcraft in every page of it oh i feel an emotion even while i am relating this methinks i see pamela at this instant with all the pride of ornament cast off 
little book charming pamela get thee gone face the world in which thou wilt find nothing like thyself happy would it be for mankind if all other books were burnt that we might do nothing but read thee all day and dream of thee all night thou alone art sufficient to teach us as much morality as we want dost thou not teach us to pray to sing psalms and to honour the clergy are not these the whole duty of man forgive me o author of pamela mentioning the name of a book so unequal to thine but now i think of it who is the author where is he what is he that hath hitherto been able to hide such an encircling all-mastering spirit he possesses every quality that art could have charmed by yet hath lent it to and concealed it in nature the comprehensiveness of his imagination must be truly prodigious it has stretched out this diminutive mere grain of mustard seed a poor girl's life etc into a resemblance of that heaven which the best of good books has compared it to to be short this book will live to the age of the patriarchs and like them will carry on the good work many hundreds of years hence among our posterity who will not hesitate their esteem with restraint if the romans granted exemptions to men who begat a few children for the republic what distinction if policy and we should ever be reconciled should we find to reward this father of millions which are to owe formation to the future effect of his influence i feel another emotion as soon as you have read this yourself five or six times over which may possibly happen within a week i desire you would give it to my little goddaughter as a present from me this being the only education we intend henceforth to give our daughters and pray let your servant maids read it over or read it to them both yourself and the neighboring clergy will supply yourselves for the pulpit from the booksellers as soon as the fourth edition is published i am sir your most humble servant thomas tickletext parson oliver to parson tickletext reverend sir i receive the favour of yours with the enclosed book and must really own myself sorry to see the report i have heard of an epidemical frenzy now ranging in town confirmed in the person of my friend if i had not known your hand i should from the sentiments and style of the letter have imagined it to have come from the author of the famous apology which was sent me last summer and on my reading the remarkable paragraph of measured fullness that resembling life outglows it to a young baronet he cried out Colly simper by god but i have since observed that this as well as many other expressions in your letter was borrowed from those remarkable epistles which the author or the editor hath prefixed to the second edition which you send me of his book is it possible that you or any of your function can be in earnest or think the cause of religion or morality can want such slender support god forbid they should as for honour to the clergy i am sorry to see them so solicitous about it for if worldly honour be meant it is what their predecessors in the pure and primitive age never had or sought indeed the secure gratification of a good conscience the approbation of the wise and good which never were or will be the generality of mankind and the ecstatic pleasure of contemplating that their ways are acceptable to the great creator of the universe will always attend those who rarely deserve these blessings but for worldly honours they are often the purchase of force and fraud we sometimes see them in an eminent degree possessed by men who are notorious for luxury pride cruelty treachery and the most abandoned prostitution wretches who are ready to invent and maintain schemes repugnant to the interest the liberty and the happiness of mankind not to supply their necessities 
or even conveniencies, but to pamper their avarice and ambition. And if this be the road to worldly honours, God forbid the clergy should be even suspected of walking in it. The history of Pamela I was acquainted with long before I received it from you, from my neighbourhood to the scene of action. Indeed, I was in hopes that young woman would have contented herself with the good fortune she hath attained, and rather suffered her little arts to have been forgotten than have revived their remembrance, and endeavoured by perverting and misrepresenting facts to be thought to deserve what she now enjoys. For though we do not imagine her the author of the narrative itself, yet we must suppose the instructions were given by her, as well as a reward, to the composer. Who that is, though you so earnestly require of me, I shall leave you to guess from that Ciceronian eloquence with which the work abounds, and that excellent knack of making every character amiable which he lays his hands on. But before I send you some papers relating to this matter, which will set Pamela and some others in a very different light than that in which they appear in the printed book, I must beg leave to make some few remarks on the book itself, and its tendency, admitting it to be a true relation, towards improving morality, or doing any good, either to the present age or posterity, which, when I have done, I shall, I flatter myself, stand excused from delivering it either into the hands of my daughter or my servant-maid. The instruction which it conveys to servant-maids is, I think, very plainly this, to look out for their masters as sharp as they can, the consequences of which will be, besides neglect of their business, and the using all manner of means to come at ornaments of their persons, that if the master is not a fool, they will be debauched by him, and if he is a fool, they will marry him, neither of which, I apprehend, my good friend, we desire should be the case of our sons. And notwithstanding our author's professions of modesty, which in my youth I have heard at the beginning of an epilogue, I cannot agree that my daughter should entertain herself with some of his pictures, which I do not expect to be contemplated without emotion, unless by one of my age and temper, who can see the girl lie on her back, with one arm round Mrs. Dukes and the other round the squire, naked in bed, with his hand on her breasts, etc., with as much indifference as I read any other page in the whole novel. But surely this, and some other descriptions, will not be put into the hands of his daughter by any wise man, though I believe it will be difficult for him to keep them from her, especially if the clergy in town have cried and preached it up, as you say. But, my friend, the whole narrative is such a misrepresentation of facts, such a perversion of truth, as you will, I am persuaded, agree, as soon as you have perused the papers I now enclose to you, that I hope you, or some other well-disposed person, will communicate these papers to the public, that this little jade may not impose on the world as she hath on her master. The true name of this wench was Shamela, and not Pamela, as she styles herself. Her father had in his youth the misfortune to appear in no good light at the old Bailey. He afterwards served in the capacity of a drummer in one of the Scotch regiments in the Dutch service, where, being drummed out, he came over to England and turned informer against several persons on the late Gin Act and becoming acquainted with an ostler at an inn where a scotch gentleman's horses stood he hath at last by his interest obtained a pretty snug place in the custom-house her mother sought oranges in the playhouse and whether she was married to her father or no i never could learn after this short introduction the rest of her history will appear in the following letters which i assure you are authentic letter one Shamala Andrews to Mrs. Henrietta Maria Honora Andrews at her lodgings at the Fan and Pepper Box in Drury Lane. Dear Mama, this comes to acquaint you that I shall set out in the wagon on Monday, desiring you to accommodate me with a lodging as near you as possible, in Colton's Court, or Wild Street, or somewhere thereabouts. Pray let it be handsome 
and not about two stories high for parson williams hath promised to visit me when he comes to town and i've got a good many fine clothes of the old put my mistress who died a while ago and i believe mrs jervis will come along with me for she says she would like to keep a house somewhere about the short gardens or towards queen street and if there was convenience for a banio she would like it the better but that she will settle herself when she comes to town oh how i long to be in the balcony at the old house so no more at present from your affectionate daughter shamala letter two shamla andrews to henrietta maria honora andrews dear mamma oh what news since i writ my last the young squire hath been here and as sure as the gun he has taken a fancy to me pamela says he for so i am called here you was a great favourite of your light mistress yes i'd please your honour says i and i believe you deserved it says he thank you honour for your good opinion says i and then he took me by the hand and i pretended to be shy lord says i sir i hope you don't intend to be rude no says he my dear and then he kissed me till he took away my breath and i pretended to be angry and to get away and then he kissed me again and breathed very short and looked very silly and by ill luck mrs jervis came in and had like to have spoiled sport how troublesome is such interruption you shall hear now soon for i shall not come away yet so i rest your affectionate daughter shamala dear sham your last letter hath put me into a great hurry of spirits for you have a very difficult part to act i hope you will remember your slip with parson williams and not be guilty of any more such folly truly a girl who hath once known what is what is in the highest degree inexcusable if she respects her digressions but a hint of this is sufficient when mrs jervis thinks of coming to town i believe i can procure her a good house and fit for the business so i am your affectionate mother henrietta maria honora andrews letter four shamla andrews to henrietta maria honora andrews mary come up good madam the mother had never looked into the oven for her daughter if she had not been there herself i shall never have done if you upbraid me with having had a small one by arthur williams when you yourself but i say no more oh with fine times when the kettle calls the pot let me do what i will i say my prayers as often as another and i read in good books as often as i have leisure and parson william says that will my commands so no more but i rest your afflicted daughter shamla dear child why will you give way to your passion how could you imagine i should be such a simpleton as to upbraid thee with being thy mother's own daughter when i advised you not to be guilty of folly i meant no more than that you should take care to be well paid beforehand and not trust to promises which a man seldom keeps after he hath had his wicked will and seeing you have had a rich fool to deal with your not making a good market will be the more inexcusable indeed with such gentlemen as parson williams there is more to be said for they have nothing to give and are commonly otherwise the best sort of men I am glad to hear you read good books. Pray continue so to do. I have enclosed you one of Mr. Whitefield's sermons, and also the dealings with him, and am your affectionate mother, Henrietta Maria, etc. Letter 6. Shamla Andrews to Henrietta Maria Honora Andrews. Oh, madam, I have strange things to tell you. As I was reading in that charming book about the dealings, in comes my master. To be sure, he is a precious one. Pamela, says he, what book is that? I warrant you Rochester's poems. No, forsooth, says I, as pertly as I could. 
"'Why, well, how now, saucy chops, bald face, says he. "'Mighty pretty words, says I, purred again. "'Yes,' says he, "'you are a d impudent, stinking, cursed, confounded jade, "'and I have a great mind to kick your a "'You kiss,' says I. "'Agad,' says he, and so I will.' With that he caught me in his arm, and kissed me till he made my face all over fire. Now this served purely, you know, to put upon the fool for anger. Oh, what precious fools men are! And so I flung from him in a mighty rage, and pretended as how I would go out at the door. But then I came to the end of the room, I stood still, and my master cried out, Hussy, slut, saucebox, bald face, come hither! "'Yes, to be sure,' says I. "'Why don't you come?' says he. "'What should I come for?' says I. "'If you don't come to me, I'll come to you,' says he. "'I shan't come to you, I assure you,' says I. "'Upon which he ran up, caught me in his arms, "'and flung me upon a chair, "'and began to offer to touch my under-petticoat. "'Sir,' says I, "'you had better not offer to be rude. "'Well,' says he, "'no more I want, then.' "'And away he went out of the room.' I was so mad to be sure I could have cried. Oh, what a prodigious vexation it is to a woman to be made a fool of! Mrs. Jervis, who had been without, hearkening, now came to me. She burst into a violent laugh the moment she came in. Well, says she, as soon as she could speak, I have reason to bless myself that I am an old woman. Ah, child! If you had known the jolly blights of my age, you would not have been left in the lurch in this manner. Dear Mrs. Jervis, says I, don't laugh at one, and to be sure I was a little angry with her. Come, says she, my dear honeysuckle, I have one game to play for you. He shall see you in bed, he shall, my little rosebud, he shall see those pretty little white round panting, and offered to pull off my handkerchief. Far, Mrs. Jervis,' says I, "'you make me blush, and upon my fackings, I believe she did.' She went on thus, "'I know the squire likes you, and notwithstanding the awkwardness of this proceeding, I am convinced hath some hot blood in his veins, which will not let him rest till he hath communicated some of his warmth to thee, my little angel. I heard him last night at our door, trying if it was open.' Now to-night I will take care it shall be so. I warrant that he makes the second trial, which if he doth, he shall find us ready to receive him. I will at first counterfeit sleep, and after a swoon, so that he will have you naked in his possession, and then, if you are disappointed, a plague of all young squires, says I. And so, Mrs. Jervis, says I, you would have me yield myself to him, would you? "'You would have me be a second time a fool for nothing. "'Thank you for that, Mrs. Jervis, for nothing. "'Mary forbid,' says she, "'you know he hath large sums of money, "'besides abundance of fine things, "'and do you think, when you have inflamed him, "'by giving his hand a liberty with that charming person, "'and that you know he might easily think "'he obtains against your will, "'he will not give anything to come at all.' "'This will not do, Mrs. Jervis,' answered I. I have heard my mamma say, and so you know, madam, I have, that in her youth, fellows have often taken away in the morning what they gave overnight. No, Mrs. Jervis, nothing under a regular taking into keeping, a settled settlement for me and all my heirs, all my whole lifetime shall do the business. Or else cross-legged is the word, faith would shame, and then I snapped my fingers. Thursday night, twelve o'clock. Mrs. Jervis and I just in bed, and the door unlocked. If my master should come. Uds Bobs! I hear him just coming in at the door. You see, I write in the present tense, as Parson William says. Well, he is in bed between us, we both shamming asleep. He steals his hand into my bosom, which I, as if in my sleep, Press close to me with mine, and then pretend to awake. I no sooner see him, but I scream out to Mrs. Jervis. She finds likewise, but just to come to herself, we both begin, 
she to be cold, and I to be scratched very liberally. After having made a pretty free use of my fingers, without any great regard to the parts I attacked, I can't feed a swoon. Mrs. Jervis then cries out, Oh, sir, what have you done? You have murdered poor Pamela. She is gone, she is gone. Oh, what a difficulty it is to keep one's countenance when the violent laugh desires to burst forth. The poor Bobby, frightened out of his wits, jumped out of bed, and, in his shirt, sat down by my bedside, pale and trembling, for the moon shone, and I kept my eyes wide open, and pretended to fix them in my head. Mrs. Jervis applied lavender water, and hot shone, and this, for a full half hour, when thinking I had carried it on long enough, and being likewise unable to continue the sport any longer, I began by degrees to come to myself. The squire, who had sat all this while speechless, and was almost really in that condition, which I feigned, the moment he saw me give symptoms of recovering my senses, fell down on his knees, and, "'Oh, Pamela!' cried he, "'can you forgive me, my injured maid? By heaven, I know not whether you are a man or a woman, unless by your swelling breast. Will you promise to forgive me? I forgive you!' D n you, says I, and d n you, says he, if you come to that, I wish I had never seen your bold face, saucy sow, and so went out of the room. Oh, what a silly fellow is a bashful young lover! He was no sooner out of hearing, as we thought, than we both burst into a violent laugh. Well, says Mrs. Jervis, I never saw anything better acted than your part, but I wish you may not have discouraged him from any future attempt especially since his passions are so cool that you could prevent his hands from going further than your bosom. "'Hang him,' answered I. "'He's not quite so cold as that, I assure you. Our hands, on neither side, were idle in the scuffle, nor have left us any doubt of each other as to that matter.' Friday morning My master sent for Mrs. Jervis as soon as he was up, and bid her give an account of the plight and linen in her care, and told her he was resolved that both she and the little gypsy, I'll assure him, should set out together. Mrs. Jervis made him a saucy answer, which any servant of spirit, you know, would, though it should be once ruined, and came immediately in tears to me, crying she had lost her place on my account, and that she should be forced to take to a house, as I mentioned before and that she hoped I would, at least, make her all the amends in my power, for her lots on my account, and come to her house whenever I was sent for. Never fear, says I, I'll warrant we are not so near being turned away as you imagine. And I could, now it comes into my head, I have a fetch for him, and you shall assist me in it. But it be now light, and my letter pretty long, no more at present from your dutiful daughter, Shamala. Mrs. Lucretia Jervis to Henrietta Maria and Nora Andrews. Madam, Miss Sham being set out in a hurry for my master's house in Lincolnshire, desired me to acquaint you with a successful stratagem, which was to dress herself in a plain neatness of a farmer's daughter, for she before all the clothes of my late mistress and to be introduced by me as a stranger to her master. To say the truth, she became a dress extremely, and if I was to keep a house a thousand years, I would never desire a prettier wench in it. As soon as my master saw her, he immediately threw his arms round her neck, and smothered her with kisses, for indeed he had but very little to say for himself to a woman. He saw that Pamela was an ugly slut. Pardon, the madam, the causes of the expression. Compared to such divine excellence, he added, he would turn Pamela away immediately, and take this new girl, whom he thought to be one of his generous daughters, in her room. Miss Shem smiled at these words, and so did your humble servant, which she perceiving, looked very earnestly at your fair daughter, and discovered cheat. How, Pamela, says he, is it you? I thought, sir, said Miss, after what had happened, you would have known me in any dress. No, 
hussy says he but after what had happened i should know thee out of any dress from all thy sex he then was what we women call rude when done in the presence of others but it seems it's not the first time and miss defended herself with a great strength and spirit the squire who thinks her pure virgin and who knows nothing of my character resolved to send her into lincolnshire on pretence of conveying her home where our old friend nanny tricks is a housekeeper and where miss had her small one by parson williams about a year ago this piece of news communicated to us by robin coachman who is entrusted by his master to carry in his affair privately for him where we hang together i believe as well as any family of servants in the nation you all i believe madam wondered at a squire who thought not want generosity should never have mentioned his settlement all this while i believe he slips his memory but it will not be long first no doubt for as i am convinced the young lady will do nothing unbecoming a daughter nor ever admit him to taste her charms without something sure and handsome beforehand so i am certain the squire will never rest till they have danced adam and eve's kissing dance together your daughter set out yesterday morning and told me as soon as she arrived he might depend on hearing from her be pleased to make my compliments acceptable to mrs davis and mrs sylvester and mrs jolly and all friends and permit me the honour madam to be with the utmost sincerity your most obedient humble servant lucretia jervis if the squire should continue his displeasure against me so as to insist on the warning he hath given me he will see me soon and i will lodge in the same house with you if you have room till i can provide for myself to my liking letter eight henrietta maria honora andrews to lucretia jervis madam i received the favour of your letter and i find you have not forgot your usual politeness which you learned when you was in keeping with the lord i am very much obliged to you for your care of my daughter am glad to hear she hath taken such good resolutions and hope she will have sufficient grace to maintain them all friends are well and remember to you you will excuse the shortness of this scroll for i have sprained my right hand with boxing three new-made officers though to my comfort i beat them all i rest your friend and servant henrietta etc letter nine shamala andrews to henrietta maria honora andrews dear mamma i suppose mrs jervis acquainted you with what parts till i left bedfordshire whence i am after a very pleasant journey arrived in lincolnshire with your old acquaintance mrs jukes who formerly helped parson williams to me and now designs i see to sell me to my master thank her for that she will find two words go to that bargain the day after my arrival here i received a letter from mr williams and as you have often desired to see one from him i have enclosed it to you it is i think the finest i ever received from that charming man and full of a great deal of learning oh what a brave thing it is to be a scholar and to be able to talk latin parson williams to pamela andrews mistress pamela having learnt by means of my clerk who yesternight visited the reverend mr peters with my commands that you are returned into this county i purposed to have saluted your fair hands this day towards even but am obliged to sojourn this night at a neighbouring clergyman's where we are to pierce a virgin barrel of ale in a cup of which i shall not be unmindful to celebrate your health i hope you have remembered your promise to bring me a leaden canister of tobacco the saffron cut 
for in truth this country at present affords nothing worthy the replenishing a tube with some i tasted the other day at an alehouse gave me the heart-burn though i filled no oftener than five times i was greatly concerned to learn that your late lady left you nothing though i cannot say the tidings much surprised me for i am too intimately acquainted with the family myself father and grandfather having been successive incumbents on the same cure which you know is in their gift i say i am too well acquainted with them to expect much from their generosity they are in verity as worthless a family as any other whatever the young gentleman i am informed is a perfect reprobate that he hath an ingenium versatile to every species of vice which indeed no one can much wonder at who animadverts on that want of respect to the clergy which was observable in him when a child i remember when he was at the age of eleven only he met my father without either pulling off his hat or riding out of the way indeed a contempt of the clergy is the fashionable vice of the times but let such wretches know they cannot hate detest and despise us half so much as we do them however i have prevailed on myself to write a civil letter to your master as there is a probability of his being shortly in a capacity of rendering me a piece of service my good friend and neighbour the reverend mr squeeze tithe being as i am informed by one whom i have employed to attend for that purpose very near his dissolution you see sweet mistress pamela the confidence with which i dictate these things to you whom after those endearments which have passed between us i must in some respects estimate as my wife for though the omission of the service was a sin yet as i have told you it was a venial one of which i have truly repented as i hope you have and also that you have continued the wholesome office of reading good books and are improved in your psalmody of which i shall have a speedy trial for i purpose to give you a sermon next sunday and shall spend the evening with you in pleasures which though not strictly innocent are however to be purged away by frequent and sincere repentance i am sweet mistress pamela your faithful servant arthur williams you find mamma what a charming way he hath of writing and yet i assure you that is not the most charming thing belonging to him for though he doth not put any dears and sweets and loves into his letters yet he says a thousand of them for he can be as fond of a woman as any man living sure women are great fools when they prefer a laced coat to the clergy whom it is our duty to honour and respect. Well, on Sunday Parson Williams came, according to his promise, at an excellent sermon he preached. His text was, Be not righteous over much, and, indeed, he handled it in a very fine way. He showed us that the Bible doth not require too much goodness of us, and that people very often call things goodness that are not so that to go to church, and to pray, and to sing psalms, and to honour the clergy, and to repent, is true religion, and tis not doing good to one another, for that is one of the greatest sins we can commit, when we don't do it for the sake of religion, that those people who talk of virtue and morality are the wickedest of all persons, that tis not what we do, but what we believe that must save us, and a great many other good things, I wish I could remember them all. As soon as church was over, 
He came to the squire's house, and drank tea with Mrs. Jukes and me, after which Mrs. Jukes went out and left us together for an hour and a half. Oh, he is a charming man. After supper he went home, and then Mrs. Jukes began to catechise me about my familiarity with him. I see she wants him herself. Then she proceeded to tell me what an honour my master did me in liking me, and that it was both an inexcusable folly and pride in me to pretend to refuse him any favour. "'Pray, madam,' says I, "'consider I am a poor girl, and have nothing but my modesty to trust to. If I part with that, what will become of me?' "'Methinks,' says she, "'you are not so mighty modest when you are with Parson Williams.' I have observed you gloat at one another in a manner that hath made me blush. I assure you, I shall let the squire know what sort of man he is. You may do your will, says I, as long as he has a vote of parliament men. The squire dares do nothing to offend him, and you will only show that you are jealous of him, that's all. How no minx, says she, minx. No more minx than yourself, says I. With that she hit me a slap on the shoulder, and I flew at her and scratched her face, occurred till she went crying out of the room. So no more at present from your dutiful daughter, Shamala. Section 2 of An Apology for the Life of Mistress Shamala Andrews by Connie Kieber this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lesson 10. Shamla Andrews to Henrietta Maria Honora Andrews. Oh, Mama! Rare news! As soon as I was up this morning, a letter was brought me from the squire, of which I send you a copy. Squire Booby to Pamela. Dear creature, I hope you are not angry with me for the deceit put upon you in conveying you to Lincolnshire when you imagined yourself going to London. Indeed, my dear Pamela, I cannot live without you and will very shortly come down and convince you that my designs are better than you imagine and such as you may with honour comply with. I am, my dear creature, your doting lover, Booby. Now, Mama, what you think you? For my own part, I am convinced he will marry me, and faith so he shall. Oh, bless me, I shall be Mrs. Bobby, and be mistress of a great estate, and have a dozen coaches, and six, and a fine house at London, and another at Bath, and servants, and jewels, and plate, and go to plays, and operas, and court, and do what I will, and spend what I will. But poor Parson Williams! Well, and can't I see Parson Williams, as well after marriage as before, for I shall never care a farthing for my husband. No, hate and despise him of all things. Well, as soon as I read my letter, in came Mrs. Jukes. You see, madam, says she, I carry the marks of your passion about me, but I have received order from my master to be civil to you, and I must obey him. For he is the best man in the world, notwithstanding your treatment of him. My treatment of him, madam, says I. Yes, says she, your insensibility to the honour he intends you, of making you his mistress. I would have you to know, madam, I would not be mistress to the greatest king, no, nor a lord in the universe. I value my virtue more than I do anything my master can give me. And so we talked a full hour and a half about my virtue, and I was afraid at first she had heard something about the bantling, but I find she hath not, though she is as jealous and suspicious as old Scratch. In the afternoon I stole into the garden to meet Mr. Williams. I found him at the place of his appointment, and we stayed in a kind of arbour till it was quite dark. He was very angry when I told him what Mrs. Jukes had threatened. Let him refuse me the living, says he, if he dares. I will vote for the other party, and not only so, but will expose him all over the country. I owe him one thousand five hundred and one. Indeed, 
but I don't care for that. By that time the election is passed, I shall be able to plead the statue of lamentations. I could have stayed with the dear man forever, but when it grew dark, he told me he was to meet a neighbouring clergy, to finish the barrel of ale they had tapped the other day, and believe they should not part till three or four in the morning. So he left me, and I promised to be patient, and go on with my reading in good books. As soon as he was gone, I bethought myself, what excuse I should make to Mrs. Jukes, and it came into my head to pretend as how I intended to drown myself. So I stripped off one of my petticoats, and threw it into the channel, and then I went and hid myself in the coal-hole, where I lay all night, and comforted myself with repeating over some psalms, and other good things, which I had got by heart. In the morning Mrs. Jukes and all the servants were frightened out of their wits, thinking I had run away, and not devising how they should answer it to their master. They searched all the likeliest places they could think of for me, and at last saw my petticoat floating in the pond. Then they got a dragnet, imagining I was drowned, and intended to drag me out. But at last more cook coming from some coals, discovered me lying all along in no very good peckle. "'Bless me! Mrs. Pamela,' says she, "'what can be the meaning of this?' "'I don't know,' says I. "'Help me up, and I will go in to breakfast, "'for indeed I am very hungry.' "'Mrs. Jukes came in immediately, "'and was so rejoiced to find me alive "'that she asked with great good humour where I had been, "'and how my petticoat came into the pond. "'I answered, "'I believe the devil had put it into my head to dry myself, "'but it was a fib, for I never saw the devil in my life, "'nor I don't believe he hath anything to do with me.' So much for this matter. As soon as I had breakfasted, a coach and six came to the door, and who should be in it but my master? I immediately ran up into my room, and stripped, and washed, and dressed myself as well as I could, and put on my prettiest rounded cap, and pulled down my stays, to show as much as I could of my bosom, for Parson William says that it is the most beautiful part of a woman and then I practised over all my airs before the glass, and then I sat down and read a chapter in the whole duty of man. Then Mrs. Jukes came to me and told me, my master wanted me below, and says she, don't behave like a fool. No, thinks I to myself, I believe I shall find wit enough for my master and you too. So down goes me into the parlour to him. Pamela, says he, the moment I came in, you see, I cannot stay along from you, which I think is sufficient proof of the violence of my passion. Yet, sir, says I, I see your honour intends to ruin me, that nothing but the destruction of my virtue will content you. Oh, what a charming word that is, rest his soul who first invented it. How can you say that I would ruin you, answered the squire, when you shall not ask anything which I will not grant you? If that be true, says I, good your honour, let me go home to my poor but honest parents. That is all I have to ask, and do not ruin a poor maiden, who is resolved to carry her virtue to the grave with her. Hussy, says he, don't provoke me, don't provoke me, I say. You are absolutely in my power, and if you won't let me lie with you by fair means, I will by force. Oh, la, sir, says I, I don't understand your poor words. "'Very pretty treatment indeed,' says he, "'to say I use poor words. "'Hussy, gypsy, hypocrite, sauce-box, bold-face, "'get out of my sight, "'or I will lend you such a kick in the—' "'I don't care to repeat the word, "'but he meant my hinder part. "'I was offering to go away, "'for I was half afraid when he called me back "'and took me round the neck and kissed me, "'and then bid me go about my business. "'I went directly into my room,' when Mrs. Jukes came to me soon afterwards. So, madam, says she, you have left my master below in a farm pet. He has threshed two or three of his men already. It is not pretty that all his servants are to be punished for your impertinence. Hark ye, madam, says I, don't you affront me, for if you do, do not me. I am sure I have repented for using such a word. If I am not revenged. How sweet is revenge! Sure the sermon-book is in the right, in calling it the sweetest morsel the devil has ever dropped into the mouth of a sinner. 
Mrs. Jukes remembered the smart of my nails too well to go farther, and so we sat down and talked about my virtue till dinner-time, and then I was sent for to wait on my master. I took care to be often caught looking at him, and then I always turned away my eyes and pretended to be ashamed. As soon as the cloth was removed, he put a bumper of champagne into my hand, and bid me drink. Oh, la, I can't name the health. Parson Williams may well say he is a wicked man. Mrs. Jukes took a glass and drank to their monosyllable. I don't understand that word, but I believe it is bawdy. I then drank towards his honour's good pleasure. Ay, hussy, says he, you can give me pleasure if you will. Sir, says I, I shall be always glad to do what is in my power, and so I pretended not to know what he meant. Then he took me into his lap. Oh, mamma, I could tell you something if I would. And he kissed me. And I said I won't be slobbered about so, so I won't. And he bid me out of the room for a saucy baggage, and said he had a good mind to spit in my face. Sure, no man ever took such a method to gain a woman's heart. I had not been long in my chamber before Mrs. Jukes came to me, and told me my master would not see me any more that evening, that is, if he can help it. For, added she, I easily perceive the great ascendance you have over him, and to confess the truth, I don't doubt but you will shortly be my mistress. What's his I, there, Mrs. Jukes? What do you say? Don't flatter a poor girl. It is impossible his honour can have any honourable design upon me. And so we talked of honourable designs to supper time, and Mrs. Jukes and I supped together upon a hot butter apple pie, and about ten o'clock we went to bed. We had not been abed half an hour when my master came pin a pat into the room in his shirt as before. I pretended not to hear him, and Mrs. Jukes laid hold of one arm, and he pulled down the bedclothes, and climbed into bed on the other side, and took my other arm and laid it under him, and fell a kiss on one of my breasts, as if he would have devoured it. I was then forced to awake, and began to struggle with him, Mrs. Jukes crying, Why don't you do it? I have one arm secure, if you can't deal with the rest I am sorry for you. He was as rude as possible to me, but I remembered, Mama, the instructions you gave me to avoid being ravished, and follow them, which soon brought him to terms, and he promised me, on quitting my hold, that he would leave the bed. Oh, Parson Williams, how little are all the men in the world compared to thee! My master was as good as his word, upon which Mrs. Duke said, Oh, sir, I see you know very little of our sect by parting so easily from the blessing when you was so near it. No, Mrs. Jukes, answered he, I am very glad no more hath happened. I would not have injured Pamela for the world. And to-morrow morning perhaps she may hear of something to her advantage. This she may be certain of, that I will never take her by force. And then he left the room. What think you now, Mrs. Pamela? said Mrs. Jukes. Are you not yet persuaded my master hath honourable designs? I think he hath given no great proof of them to-night, said I. Your experience, I find, is not great, says she, but I am convinced you will shortly be my mistress, and then what will become of poor me? With such sort of discourse we both fell asleep. Next morning early my master sent for me, and after kissing me, gave me a paper into my hand, which he bid me read. I did so, and find it to be a proposal for settling two hundred a year on me, besides several other advantages offers, as presents for money and other things. Well, Pamela, said he, what answer do you make me to this? Sir, said I, I value my virtue more than all the world, and I had rather be poorest man's wife than the richest man's whore. You are a simpleton, said he. That may be, and yet I may have as much wit as some folk, cried I. Meaning me, I suppose, said he, Every man knows himself best, says I. Hussy, says he, get out of the room, and let me see your saucy face no more, for I find I am no more danger than you are, and therefore it shall be my business to avoid you as much as I can. And it shall be mine, thinks I, at every turn to throw myself in your way. So I went out, and as I parted, I heard him sigh and say he was bewitched. Mrs. Jukes hath been with me since, and she assures me she is convinced I shall shortly be mistress of the family, 
and she really behaves to me, as if she really thought me so. I am resolved now to aim at it. I thought once of making a little fortune by my person, and now intend to make a great one by my virtue. So asking pardon for this long scroll, I am your dutiful daughter, Shamla. Letter 11. Henrietta Maria Honora Andrews to Shamala Andrews. Dear Sham, I received your last letter with infinite pleasure, and am convinced it will be your own fault if you are not married to your master, and I would advise you now to take no less terms. But, my dear child, I am afraid of one rock only, that Parson Williams. I wish he was out of the way. A woman never commits folly but with such sort of men, as by many hints in the letters I collect him to be. But consider, my dear child, you will hereafter have opportunities sufficient to indulge yourself with Parson Williams, or any other you like. My advice, therefore, to you is that you would avoid seeing him any more till the knot is tied. Remember the first lesson I taught you that a married woman injures only her husband, but a single woman herself. I am in hopes of seeing you a great lady. Your affectionate mother, Henrietta Maria, etc. The following letter appears to have been written before Shamala received the last from her mother. Letter 12. Shamala Andrews to Henrietta Maria Honora Andrews. Dear Mama, I little feared when I sent away my last that all my hopes would be so soon frustrated, but I am certain you will blame fortune and not me. To proceed then, about two hours after I had left the squire, he sent for me into the parlour. Pamela, said he, and takes me gently by the hand, will you walk with me in the garden? Yes, sir, says I, and pretended to tremble, but I hope your honour will not be rude. Indeed, says he, you have nothing to fear from me, and I have something to tell you, which, if it doth not place you, cannot offend. We walked out together, and he began thus, Pamela, will you tell me truth? Doth the resistance you make to my attempts proceed from virtue only, or have I not some rival in thy dear bosom, who might be more successful? Sir, says I, I do assure you, I never had a thought of any man in the world. How, says he, not of Parson Williams. Parson Williams, says I, is the last man upon earth, and if I was a duchess, and your honour was to make your addresses to me, you would have no reason to be jealous of any rival, especially such a fellow as Parson Williams. If ever I had a liking, I am sure. But I am not worthy of you one way, and no riches should ever bribe me the other. My dear, says he, you are worthy of everything, and suppose I should lay aside all considerations of fortune, and disregard the censure of the world, and marry you. Oh, sir, says I, I am sure you can have no such thoughts. You cannot demean yourself so low. Upon my soul, I am in earnest, says he. Oh, pardon me, sir, says I, you can't persuade me of this. How, mistress, says he, in a violent rage, do you give me the lie, hussy, I have a great mind to box your saucy ears, but I am resolved I will never put it in your power to affront me again, and therefore I desire you to prepare yourself for your journey this instant. You deserve no better vehicle than a cart. However, for once you shall have a chariot, and it shall be ready for you within this half hour. And so he flung from me in a fury. What a foolish thing it is for a woman to dally too long with her lover's desires! How many have owed their being old maids to their holding out too long? Mrs. Jukes came to me presently, and told me, I must make ready with all the expedition imaginable, for that my master had ordered a chariot, and that if I was not prepared to go in it, I should be turned out of doors, and left to find my way home on foot. They startled me a little, yet I resolved, whether in the right or wrong, not to submit nor ask pardon. For that you know, Mama. You never could yourself bring me to from my childhood. Besides, I thought he would be no more able to master his passion for me now than he had been hitherto, and if he sent two horses away with me, I concluded he would send four to fetch me back. So, truly, I resolved to brace it out, 
and with all the spirit I could master up, I told Mrs. Chukes I was vastly pleased with the news she brought me, that no one ever went more readily than I should, from a place where my virtue had been in continual danger, that as for my master, he might easily get those who were fit for his purpose, but, for my part, I preferred my virtue to all rights whatever, and for his promises, and his offers to me, I don't value them a fig. Not a fig, Mrs. Jukes, and then I snapped my fingers. Mrs. Jukes went in with me, and helped me to pack up my little owl, which was soon done, being no more than two day caps, two night caps, five shifts, one sham, a hoop, a quilted petticoat, two flannel petticoats, two pair of stockings, one odd one, a pair of laced shoes, a short flowered apron, a laced neck handkerchief, one clog, and almost another, and some few books, as a full answer to a plain and true account, and say, the whole duty of man, with only the duty to one's neighbour, torn out. The third volume of the Atalantis, Venus in the Cloister, or The Nun in Her Smock, God's Dealings with Mr. Whitefield, Authors and Eurydice, some sermon books, and two or three plays, with their titles, and part of the first act torn off. So as soon as we had put all this into a bundle, the chariot was ready, and I took leave of all the servants, and particularly Mrs. Jukes, who pretended, I believe, to be more sorry to part with me than she was, and then crying out with an air of indifference, my service to my master, when he consented to inquire after me, I flung myself into the chariot and bid Robin drive on. We had not gone far before a man on horseback, riding full speed, overtook us, and coming up to the side of the chariot, threw a letter into the window, and then departed without uttering a single syllable. I immediately knew the hand of my dear Williams, and was somewhat surprised, though I did not apprehend the contents to be so terrible, as by the following exact copy you will find them. Parson Williams to Pamela Dear Mistress Pamela, that disrespect for the clergy, which I have formerly noted to you in that villain your master, hath now broke forth in a manifest fact. I was proceeding to my neighbour Spruce's church, where I purposed to preach a funeral sermon on the death of Mr. John Gage, the excise man, when I was met by two persons, who are, it seems, sheriff's officers, and arrested for the one hundred and fifty pounds which your master had lent me. And unless I can find bail within these few days, of which I see no likelihood, I shall be carried to jail. This accounts for my not having visited you these two days, which you might assure yourself I should not have failed, if the potestas had not been wanting. If you can by any means prevail on your master to release me, I beseech you so to do, not scrupling anything for righteousness sake i hear he is just arrived in this country i have herewith sent him a letter of which i transmit you a copy so with prayers for your success i subscribe myself your affectionate friend arthur williams Parson Williams to Squire Booby. Honoured sir, I am justly surprised to feel so heavy a weight of your displeasure, without being conscious of the least demerit towards so good and generous a patron as I have ever found you. For my own part, I can truly say, Nil conscire sibi nullae palescere culpae. And therefore, as this proceeding is so contrary to your usual goodness, which I have often experienced, and more especially in the loan of this money for which I am now arrested, I cannot avoid thinking some malicious persons have insinuated false suggestions against me 
intending thereby to eradicate those seeds of affection which i have hardly travailed to sow in your heart and which promised to produce such excellent fruit if i have any ways offended you sir be graciously pleased to let me know it and likewise to point out to me the means whereby i may reinstate myself in your favour for next to him whom the great themselves must bow down before i know none to whom i shall bend with more lowliness than your honour permit me to subscribe myself honoured sir your most obedient and most obliged and most dutiful humble servant arthur williams the fight of poor mr williams shocked me more than my own for as the beggar's opera says nothing moves one so much as a great man in distress and to see a man of his learning forced to submit so low to one whom i have often heard him say he despises is i think a most affecting circumstance i write all this to you dear mamma at the inn where i lie this first night and as i shall send it immediately by the post it will be in town a little before me don't let my coming away vex you for as my master will be in town in a few days i shall have an opportunity of seeing him and let the worst come to the worst i shall be sure of my settlement at last which is all from your dutiful daughter, Shamala. P.S. Just as I was going to send this away, a letter is come from my master, desiring me to return with a large number of promises. I have him now as sure as a gun, as you will perceive by the letter itself, which I have enclosed to you. This letter is unhappily lost, as well as the next which Shamala wrote, and which contained an account of all the proceedings previous to her marriage. The only remaining one which I could preserve seems to have been written about a week after the ceremony was performed, and is as follows. Shamala Booby to Henrietta Maria Honora Andrews Madam, in my last I left off at our sitting down to supper in our wedding night, where I behaved with as much bashfulness as the purest virgin in the world could have done. The most difficult task for me was to blush. However, by holding my breath and squeezing my cheeks with my handkerchief, I did pretty well. My husband was extremely eager and impatient to have supper removed, after which he gave me leave to retire into my closet for a quarter of an hour, which was very agreeable to me, for I implored that time in writing to Mr. Williams, who, as I informed you in my last, is released, and presented to the living upon the death of the last parson. Well, at last I went to bed, and my husband soon leaped in after me, where, I shall only assure you, I acted my part in such a manner that no bridegroom was ever better satisfied with his bride's virginity. And to confess the truth, I might have been well enough satisfied too, if I had never been acquainted with Parson Williams. Oh, what regard men who marry widows should have to the qualifications of their former husbands! We did not rise the next morning till eleven, and then we sat down to breakfast. I ate two slices of bread and butter, and dragged three dishes of tea, with a good deal of sugar, and we both looked very silly. After breakfast we dressed ourselves, he in a blue camlet coat, very richly laced, and breeches of the same, with a padua for a waistcoat, laced with silver, and I in one of my mistress's gowns. I will have finer when I come to town." We then took a walk in the garden, and he kissed me several times, and made me a present of hundred guineas, which I gave away before night to the servants, twenty to one, and ten to another, and so on. We ate a very hearty dinner, and about eight in the evening went to bed again. He is prodigiously found on me, but I don't like him half so well as my dear Williams. The next morning we rose earlier, and I asked him for another hundred guineas, and he gave them me. I sent fifty to Parson Williams, and the rest I gave away, two guineas to a beggar, and three to a man riding along the road, and the rest to other people. I longed to be in London that I may have the opportunity of laying some out, as well as giving away. I believe I shall buy everything I see. What signifies having money if one doth not spend it? 
The next day, as soon as I was up, I asked him for another hundred. Well, my dear, says he, I don't grudge you anything, but how is it possible for you to lay out the other two hundred here? La, sir, says I, I hope I am not obliged to give you an account of every shilling. Troth, that will be being your servant still. I assure you, I married you with no such view. Besides, did you not tell me I should be mistress of your estate? And I will be, too, for though I brought no fortune, I am as much your wife as if I had brought a million. Yes, but my dear, says he, if you had brought a million, you would spend it all at this rate. Besides, what will your expenses be in London, if they are so great here? Truly, says I, sir, I shall live like other ladies of my fashion. And if you think, because I was a servant, that I shall be contented to be governed as you please, I will show you, you are mistaken. If you had not cared to marry me, you might have let it alone. I did not ask you, nor I did not court you. Madam, says he, I don't value a hundred guineas to oblige you, but this is a spirit which I did not expect in you, nor did I ever see any symptoms of it before. Oh, but times are altered now. I am your lady, sir. Yes, to my sorrow, says he, I am afraid. And I am afraid to my sorrow, too, for if you begin to use me in this manner already, I reckon you will beat me before a month's at an end. For I am sure if you did, it would injure me less than this barbarous treatment. Upon which I burst into tears, and pretended to fall into a fit. This frightened him out of his wits, and he called up the servants. Mrs. Jukes immediately came in, and she and another of the mites fell heartily to rubbing my temples, and holding smelling bottles to my nose. Mrs. Jukes told him she'd fear I should never recover, upon which he began to beat his breasts, and cried out, "'Oh, my dearest angel! Curse on my passionate temper! I have destroyed her! I have destroyed her!' Would she had spent my whole estate rather than this had happened? Speak to me, my love. I will melt myself into gold for thy pleasure. At last, having pretty well tired myself with counterfeiting, and imagining I had continued long enough for my purpose in the sham fit, I began to move my eyes, to loosen my teeth, and to open my hands, which Mr. Booby no sooner perceived than he embraced and kissed me with the eagerest ecstasy, asked my pardon on his knees for what I had suffered through his folly and perseverance, and without more questions fetched me the money. I fancy I have effectually prevented any farther refusals or inquiry about my expenses. It would be hard indeed that a woman who marries a man only for his money should be debarred from spending it. Well, after all things were quiet, we sat down to breakfast. Yet I resolved not to smile once, nor to say one good night shirt or good humoured word on any account. Nothing can be more prudent in a wife than a sullen backwardness to reconciliation. It makes a husband fearful of offending by the length of his punishment. When we were dressed, the coach was by my desire ordered for an airing, which we took in it. A long silence prevailed on both sides, though he constantly squeezed my hand, and kissed me, and used all the familiarities which I peevishly permitted. At last I opened my mouth first. And so, says I, you are sorry you are married. Pray, my dear, says he, forget what I said in a passion. Passion, says I, is apter to discover our thoughts than to teach us to counterfeit. Well, says he, whether you will believe me or not, I solemnly vow I would not change thee for the richest woman in the universe. No, I warrant you, says I, and yet you could refuse me a nasty hundred pound. At these very words I saw Mr. Williams riding as fast as he could across the field, and I looked out and saw a lease of greyhounds cursing a hare, which they presently killed, and I saw him alight and take her from them. My husband ordered Robin to drive towards him, and looked horribly out of humour, which I presently imputed to jealousy. So I began with him first, for that is the wisest way. La, sir, says I, what makes you look so angry and grim? Doth the sight of Mr. Williams give you all this uneasiness? I am sure I would never have married a woman of whom I had so bad an opinion, that I must be uneasy at every fellow she looks at. My dear, answered he, you injure me extremely. You was not in my thoughts, nor indeed could be, while they were covered by so morose a countenance. I am justly angry with that parson, whose family hath been raised from the dunghill by us. 
and who hath received from me twenty kindnesses, and yet is not contented to destroy the game in all other places, which I freely give him leave to do, but hath the impudence to pursue a few hairs, which I am desirous to preserve, round about this little coppice. Look, my dear, pray look, says he, I believe he's going to turn Higgler. To confess the truth, he had no less than three tied up behind his horse, and a fourth he held in his hand. "'Pshaw,' says I, "'I wish all the hares in the country were dead. "'The parson himself chid me afterwards for using the word, "'though it was in his service. "'Here's a fuss, indeed, about a nasty little pitiful creature "'that is not half so useful as a cat. "'You shall not persuade me that a man of your understanding "'would quarrel with a clergyman for such a trifle. "'No, no, I am the hare for whom poor Parson Williams is persecuted, "'and jealousy is the motive.' If you had married one of your quality ladies, she would have had lovers by dozens. She would so, but because you have taken a servant maid, forsooth, you are jealous if she'll but looks. And then I began to watch her, as a poor pa 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 parson in his pu pu pulpit, and then out burst a flood of tears. My dear, said he, for heaven's sake dry your eyes, and don't let him be a witness of your tears, which I should be sorry to think might be imputed to my unkindness. I have already given you some proof that I am not jealous of this parson. I will now give you a very strong one, for I will mount my horse, and you shall take Williams into the coach. You may be sure that this motion pleased me, that I pretended to make as light of it as possible, and told him I was sorry his behaviour had made some such glaring instance necessary to the perfect clearing my character. He soon came up to Mr. Williams, who had attempted to ride off, but was prevented by one of our horsemen, whom my husband sent to stop him. When we met, my husband asked him how he did with a very good-humoured air, and told him he perceived he had found good spot that morning. He answered pretty moderate, sir, for that he had found three hairs tied on to the saddle dead in a ditch, winking on me at the same time, and added he was sorry there was such a rot among them. Well, says Mr. Booby, if you please, Mr. Williams, you shall come in and ride with my wife. For my own part, I will mount on horseback, for it is fine weather, and besides, it does not become me to loll in a chariot, whilst the clergyman rides on horseback. At which words Mr. Booby leapt out, and Mr. Williams leapt in, in an instant, telling my husband as he mounted, he was glad to see such a reformation, and that if he continued his respect to the clergy, he might assure himself a blessing from above. It was now that the airing began to grow pleasant to me. Mr. Williams, who never had but one fault, with that he generally smelled of tobacco, was now perfectly sweet, for he had for two days together enjoined himself as a penance, not to smoke till he had kissed my lips. I will loosen you from that obligation, says I, and, observing my husband looking another way, I gave him a charming kiss, and then he asked me questions concerning my wedding night. This actually made me blush. I wow I did not think it had been in him. As he went along, he began to discourse very learnedly, and told me the flesh and the spirit were two distinct matters, which had not the least relation to each other, that all immaterial substances, those were his very words, such as love, desire, and so forth, were guided by the spirit, but fine houses, large estates, coaches, and dainty entertainments were the product of the flesh. Therefore, says he, my dear, you have two husbands, one of the object of your love, and to satisfy your desire, the other the object of your necessity, and to furnish you with those good conveniences. I am sure I remember every word, for he repeated it three times. Oh, he is very good whenever I desire him to repeat a thing to me three times, he always does it. As then the spirit is preferable to the flesh, so I am preferable to your other husband, to which I am incident in time likewise. I say these things, my dear, said he, to satisfy your conscience. A fig for my conscience, said I. When shall I meet you again in the garden? My husband now rode up to the chariot, and asked us how we did. I hate the sight of him. Mr. Williams answered very well, at your service. Then they talked of the weather, and other things. I wished him gone again, every minute, but all in vain I had no more opportunity of conversing with Mr. Williams. Well, at dinner Mr. Booby was very civil to Mr. Williams, and told him he was sorry for what had happened, and would make him a sufficient amends. 
if in his power, and desired him to accept of a note of fifty pounds, which he was so good to receive, notwithstanding all that had passed, and told Mr. Booby he hoped he would be forgiven, and that he would pray for him. We make a charming fool of him, E. Fackins. Times are finely altered. I have entirely got the better of him, and I am resolved to never give him his humour. Oh, how foolish it is in a woman, who hath once got the reins into her own hand, ever to quit him again. After dinner, Mr. Williams drank the church, etc., and smiled on me. When my husband's turn came, he drank, etc., in the church, for which he was very severely rebuked by Mr. Williams, it being a high crime, it seemed, to name anything before the church. I do not know what etc. is, but I believe it is something concerning choosing Parliament men. For I asked if it was not the health to Mr. Booby's borough, and Mr. Williams, with a hearty laugh, answered, Yes, yes, it is his borough we mean. I slipped out as soon as I could, hoping Mr. Williams would finish the squire, as I have heard him say he could easily do, and come to me. But it happened quite otherwise, for in about half an hour Booby came to me, and told me he had left Mr. Williams, the mayor of his borough, and two or three elder men heartily at it, and asked me if I would go hear Williams sing a catch, which, added he, he doth to a miracle. Every opportunity of seeing my dear Williams was agreeable to me, which indeed I scarce had at this time, for when he returned the whole corporation were got together, and the room was in a cloud of tobacco. Parson Williams was at the upper end of the table, and he had pure round cherry cheeks, and his face looked all the world to nothing like the sun in a fog. If the son had a pipe in his mouth, there would be no difference. I began now to grow uneasy, apprehending I should have no more of Mr. Williams' company that evening, and not at all caring for my husband, I advised him to sit down and drink for his country with the rest of the company, but he refused, and desired me to give him some tea, swearing nothing made him so sick as to hear a parcel of scoundrels roaring forth at the principle of honest men over their cups, when— says he, I know most of them are such empty blockheads, that they don't know their right hand from the left. And that fellow there, who has talked so much of shipping at the left side of the parson, in whom they all place a confidence, if I don't take care, will sell them to my adversary. I don't know why I mentioned it stuff to you, for I am sure I know nothing about politics, more than Parson Williams tells me. Who says that the court side are in the right aunt? and every Christian ought to be on the same side with the bishop. When we had finished our tea, we walked in the garden till it was dark, and then my husband proposed, instead of returning to the company, which I desired that I might see Parson Williams again, to sup in another room by ourselves, which, for fear of making him jealous, and considering too that Parson Williams would be pretty far gone, I was obliged to consent to. Oh, what a devilish thing it is! for a woman to be obliged to go to bed to a spindle-shanked young squire she does not like when there is a jolly parson in the same house she is fond of in the morning i grew very peevish and in the dumps notwithstanding all he could say or do to please me i exclaimed against the privilege of husbands and vowed i would not be pulled and trumbled about at last he hit on the only method which would have brought me into humour, and proposed to me a journey to London within a few days. This you might easily guess pleased me, for besides the desire I have of showing myself forth, of buying fine clothes, jewels, coaches, houses, and ten thousand other fine things, Parson Williams is, it seems, going thither too, to be instituted. Oh, what a charming journey I shall have, for I hope to keep the dear man in the chariot with me all the way, and that foolish booby, for that is the name Mr. Williams hath set him, will ride on horseback. So as I shall have an opportunity of seeing you so shortly, I think I will mention no more matters to you now. Oh, I had like to have forgot one very material thing, which is that it will look horribly for a lady of my quality and fashion to own such a woman as you for my mother. Therefore we must meet in private only, and if you will never claim me, nor mention me to any one, I will always allow you what is very handsome. Parson William hath greatly advanced me in this, and says he thinks I should do very well to lay out twenty pounds, and set you up in a little chandler's shop. But you must remember all my favours to you will depend on your secrecy, for I am positively resolved. I will not be known to be your daughter, and if you tell any one so, I shall deny it with all my might 
which Parson Williams says I may do with a safe conscience, being now a married woman. So I rest. Your humble servant, Shamala. P.S. The strangest fancy hath entered into my Bobby's head that can be imagined. He is resolved to have a book made about him and me. He proposed it to Mr. Williams, and offered him a reward for his pains, but he says he never writ anything of that kind, but will recommend my husband when he comes to town, to a parson who does that sort of business for folks, one who can make my husband, and me, and Parson Williams, to be all great people, for he can make black white, it seems. Well, but they say my name is to be altered. Mr. Williams says the first syllable hath too comical a sound. So it is to be changed to Pamela. I own I can't imagine what can be said, for to be sure I shan't confess any of my secrets to them, and so I whispered Parson Williams about that, who answered me, I need not give myself any trouble, for the gentleman who writes lives never asked more than a few names of his customers, and that he made all the rest out of his own head. You mistake, child, said he, if you apprehend any truths are to be delivered. So far, on the contrary, if you had not been acquainted with the name, you would not have known it to be your own history. I have seen a piece of his performance, where the persons whose life was written, could he have risen from the dead again, would not have even suspected that he had been aimed at, unless by the title of the book, which was subscribed with his name. Well, all these matters are strange to me, yet I can't help laughing, to think I shall see myself in a printed book. So much for Mrs. Shamala or Pamela, which I have taken pains to transcribe from the originals sent down by her mother in a rage at the proposal in her last letter. The originals themselves are in my hands, and shall be communicated to you if you think proper to make them public, and certainly they will have their use. The character of Shamala will make young gentlemen wary how they take the most fatal step both to themselves and families by youthful, hasty, and improper matches. Indeed, they may assure themselves that all such prospects of happiness are vain and delusive, and that they sacrifice all the solid comforts of their lives to a very transient satisfaction of a passion, which, how hot soever it be, will be soon cooled, and when cooled will afford them nothing but repentance. Can anything be more miserable than to be despised by the whole world, and that must certainly be the consequence, to be despised by the person obliged, which it is more than probable will be the consequence, and of which we see an instance in Shamala, and lastly to despise one's self, which must be the result of any reflection on so weak and unworthy a choice. As to the character of Parson Williams, I am sorry it is a true one. Indeed, those who do not know him will hardly believe it so. But what scandal doth it throw on the order to have one bad member, unless they endeavour to screen and protect him? In him you see a picture of almost every vice exposed in nauseous and odious colours. And if a clergyman would ask me by what pattern he should form himself, I would say, be the reverse of Williams. So far, therefore, he may be of use to the clergy themselves, and though God forbid there should be many Williamses among them, you and I are too honest to pretend that the body wants no reformation. To say the truth, I think no greater instance of the contrary can be given than that which appears in your letter. The confederating to cry up a nonsensical, ridiculous book, I believe the most extensively so of any ever yet published, and to be so weak and so wicked as to pretend to make it a matter of religion, whereas, so far from having any moral tendency, the book is by no means innocent. For, first, there are many lascivious images in it, very improper to be laid before the youth of either sex. Secondly, Young gentlemen are here taught that to marry their mother's chambermaids and to indulge the passion of lust at the expense of reason and common sense is an act of religion, virtue, and honour, and indeed the surest road to happiness. Thirdly, old chambermaids are strictly enjoined to look out after their masters. They are taught to use little arts to that purpose and lastly, are countenanced in impertinence to their superiors, and in betraying the secrets of families. Fourthly, 
in the character of Mrs. Duke's vice is rewarded, whence every housekeeper may learn the usefulness of pimping and boarding for her master. Fifthly, in Parson Williams, who is represented as a faultless character, we see a busy fellow intermeddling with the private affairs of his patron, whom he is very ungratefully forward to expose and condemn on every occasion. Many more objections might, if I had time or inclination, to be made to this book, but I apprehend what hath been said is sufficient to persuade you of the use which may arise from publishing an antidote to this poison. I have therefore sent you the copies of these papers, and if you have leisure to communicate them to the press, I will transmit to you the originals, though I assure you the copies are exact. I shall only add that there is not the least foundation for anything which is said of Lady Darvers, or any of the other ladies, all that is merely to be imputed to the invention of the biographer. I have particularly inquired after Lady Darvers, and don't hear Mr. Booby hath such a relation, or that there is indeed any such person existing. I am, dear sir, most faithfully and respectfully, your humble servant, J. Oliver. Parson Tickle Text To Parson Oliver Dear Sir, I have read over the history of Shamala as it appears in those authentic copies you favored me with, and am very ashamed of the character which I was hastily prevailed on to give that book. I am equally angry with the pert jade herself, and with the author of her life, for I scarce know yet to whom I chiefly owe my imposition, which hath been so general, that if numbers could defend me from shame, I should have no reason to apprehend it. As I have your implied leave to publish what you so kindly sent me, I shall not wait for the originals, as you assure me the copies are exact. And as I am really impatient to do what I think a serviceable act of justice to the world. Finding by the end of her letter that the little hussy was in town, I made it pretty much my business to inquire after her, but with no effect hitherto. As soon as I succeed in this inquiry, you shall hear what discoveries I can learn. You will pardon the shortness of this letter, as you shall be troubled with a much longer very soon. And believe me, dear sir, your most faithful servant, Thomas Ticklext. P.S. Since I writ, I have a certain account that Mr. Booby hath caught his wife in bed with Williams, hath turned her off, and is prosecuting him in the spiritual court. End of An Apology for the Life of Mistress Shamala Andrews by Connie Kieber. Narrator read by Patty Cunningham. Connie Kieber. Read by Noel Badrian. John Puff. Read by Bob Gonzalez. Thomas Ticklext. Read by Chuck Williamson. Parson J. Oliver. Read by Algie Pug. Shamala. Read by Christine G. Henrietta Maria Honora Andrews. Read by Margaret Espayat. Mrs. Lucrecia Jervis. Read by April Gonzalez. Parson Arthur Williams. Read by Martin Geeson. Booby, read by Hermann Roskans.